Hello, grappling fans. Happy Monday. It is another episode of the Grappling Bulletin podcast. Time to recap some of the biggest action from the weekend. And what a weekend it was. Myself, Hal Teague, joined as always by Chase Smith in the back. We've got Corey Stockton. And it's time to talk about some jujitsu. It's my favorite thing to do. Yeah, what happened this weekend? Remind me. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Gordon Ryan calling his shot. What a, what a, an event that was. I mean, first off, Who's number one? It's always a lot of fun. Chase and I, Matt side, getting to call the action. It's pretty awesome, right? Yeah, and I feel like each show is getting better and tighter. We're having a lot of fun, you know, producing these. It's a flow grappling owned event, owned and operated. So that's our jam, baby. And each time you add a little new twist. So hope you guys are enjoying it at home. But it was an amazing show. Lots of great fights, I feel like. Um, <laughs> every match. For every me, match. it's hard picking a favorite, to be honest. But I, I was blown away by the, by the quality of all the matches. Some fun subs. Of course, the Gordon Ryan experience is one of a kind. So I had a good time. Corey, what would you take away from the Gordon one? Ryan experience? That sounds like a podcast. But yeah, <laughs> Corey, what do you think, man? Man, there were so, there were so many great matches and uh, a, a lot of subs. I think there were four of the seven matches ended in submission. Um, and even still, the matches that ended in submission, we got to see a lot of jujitsu first. So it wasn't like they were there were blowouts, right? We got um, just one one for example, uh, Rafael Guedes versus Maggie Grandotti. That was a, a long match, um, fun to watch the whole way through, and we got a submission. You can say the same of Mikey Moose Mechie versus Marcelo Cohen. Um, so best of both worlds, right? Ends in a sub, but you get a lot of action leading up to that sub. You get to see some good jujitsu. That's right. That's what the that's what the show is all about. And um, I even saw a really interesting uh, comment on Instagram. Kainan Duarte mm -hmm. actually said that he feels that who's number one rules are the best rules for no gi jujitsu. That's high praise coming from somebody like him. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that's about as good as it gets from an ADCC champ, you know. Um, I'm glad to hear it. I think so too. I not just ADCC, World No Gi, Kasai, yes, yes. ADCC, and not taking anything away from any of those other events. But when Kainan, who obviously competed on our event against Adolfo a couple months ago, is like, oh yeah, I love competing on who's number one. We're like, hell yeah, let's get him back. But <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what happened on Friday because it was such a huge event and you probably know the results already. So we're not going to go too deep into the whole thing and, uh, and break down match by match. I think we'll do that on the Who's Number One podcast coming up on Wednesday. We'll kick it over to the other guys, Michael, uh, Reed, and let those guys really get into the, the ins and outs of the event and analyze the matches in a little bit more depth. Because right now, you know, this is a, you know, a very busy weekend in jiu-jitsu, but we can't ignore Gordon Ryan calling his shot in a very unusual manner. Let's play this video while we're talking about it because it's really cool. Chase, you had no idea this was happening. You were None. more shocked than met anybody, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I saw that he had a, an envelope the day before, but I thought he was going to put it on his Instagram. I had completely forgotten about it. But sure. You can see him carrying it, right? There, there he is. He's walking up. And yeah. There weren't many people in the room. It's a closed event. But the few that saw him walk out were like, oh, my God, what is going to happen right yeah. now? Yeah, it was like, I could, I, I could see people, because we're locked into the commentary, of course, we've got a job to do, but you know, there are some spectators in the room, some VIPs, and you know, it's a very select crowd. And I kind of caught at the corner of my eye that these guys were just mouths open, like, what's going on? What is this? What is this? What is this envelope? And of course, Gordon, he wrote his prediction for the match, but on the piece of paper, signed it, sealed it, and then gave me the envelope as he walked onto the mat, put it on my desk, and then went, competed against Wagner, won by triangle. Of course, then he came over. He sits down for the post-match interview, and that's the point where I opened the envelope live during that interview, because I was like, okay, now we need to see what's in here. And it had written, it had, actually had written on the envelope. It was open me after. So, of course, I open it up, and what is it? Well, you'll see in a second. But, I mean, it was an it, it was a very, very good match, though, right? And surprisingly competitive. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, Wagner did a great job of remaining calm in some tough spots, fought his way out. And, uh, of course, Gordon was looking for a specific opportunity. But uh, I really enjoyed it. And I especially liked, oh, here's the reveal, actually. Let's, the reveal. let's watch this, yeah. Yeah, there's no audio on this clip, but you can, you know, obviously guess what we're talking about. There it is. A picture says a thousand words. Who kept that? Who's Who kept the card? Anybody? Next? It went missing. I don't know who took it, actually. <laughs> Some like, it eager was, collector out there has it. Very possibly. <laughs> it was on my desk, and then I came back a couple of minutes later, and it was gone. So I do not know. But clinical finish. Corey, what did you think of that match? Yeah, you know, um, the, Gordon looked uh, obviously great, but I was really impressed by, by Wagner. Um, you know, Wagner had his back taken for 
half the match almost, and then he was able to try and mount some offense. Uh, you know, after escape and back control, he was going after leg locks and things like that. So Wagner was classy all the way through um, and was was able to uh, to to continue fighting. Uh, but but Gordon is just, and we've said this how how many times he is a head and shoulders above everybody else. Yeah, what, there was an incredible stat that he actually uh, he posted on his Instagram uh, this morning, and uh, he said that. If you consider the the pound for pound top 10 ranking right now, he's fought seven of them. There are only two people in the pound for pound ranking that he hasn't fought because, of course, he makes up the, the remaining one. He's fought seven of the 10 top 10 pound for pound grapplers in the world, and he's submitted all seven of them. That's crazy. That is Who can next be? Like that level. Is, that is the question right now yeah. in jiu-jitsu, and, and especially, of course, we're talking about Nogi, but I mean... I want to find out that out too. I want to see who can really push Gordon. And uh, before we get too far away from the Wagner match, though, I'd like to say that I know the whole team was really, really thrilled to see um, them kind of resolve their issues on the mat. Yeah. They had a great moment afterwards, shook hands. It was all respect. Gordon, in his post-event interview, said that he's a big fan of Wagner's and respects the team. Isn't that cool? It's great because things were a little tense leading in, right? Oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, of course, you know, a match this high profile and there was definitely some history there. And, you know, Wagner was... Um, you know, he had a message for Gordon and, you know, he, he called him out on his behavior, but he said he respected him as a grappler. But then, of course, there was the, you know, the accusations that, you know, Gordon said that Wagner had bullied him in the past. And if you watch the, the press conference here at this very table, you know, on the Thursday uh, last week, you know, there was a moment there when Gordon was saying, yeah, you poked me in the eye and Wagner was like getting kind of upset by the accusations, you know, mm -hmm. so it was definitely tense. But they put it all to bed the moment that the fight was over, the match was over. That was it. And that's what we want to see. So. Secondly, I'd like to issue a public apology for talking over the the chatter during the match. Because yeah. I, if you had watched Sorry, the stream, guys. Hal and I are heard, heard commentating saying, they're talking to each other, they're talking to each other. Well, apparently you guys at home could hear it because we had the, the mats mic, but we were not getting that feed. Yeah. And, so, and we had these big <laughs> ass headphones on, so we couldn't hear anything except each other. So I and felt we bad like, afterwards. I read the comments. I'm like, damn it. They, they could hear them. Yeah, yeah. We're like, I wonder what they're saying. And everybody's at home like, shut up so we can hear them. <laughs> Sorry. Guys. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Next time, next time our producers won't, won't make that same mistake. So. Yeah, yeah. Blame those Blame guys. the other guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. But... You know, they were drawing at each other. I'd love to, I'd love to know. It was a fun match, for sure. Uh, most notable result. Let's just, very quick. Corey, your favorite match that wasn't Gordon Ryan versus Wagner, your favorite match from Who's Number One last oh, week? Nicky Rod looked absolutely like a different competitor altogether. He wasn't able to get the submission, but... We, we didn't see any wrestling. It didn't matter. His he guard didn't wrestle passing, once. That's yeah. crazy, right? And and everybody going into this break, this would be a, just a brawl. But we got to see something better, which is the evolution of Nicky Rod and his jiu-jitsu, which looks phenomenal, especially against a two-time ADCC champ, multiple-time Nogi world champ, Yuri Samoyes. Yeah, 2.0 Nicky Rod right there. That's a scary thought. The guy's doing jiu-jitsu now. I did like his post-match interview. He's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got some jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We all messed up. The fact that he wore a rash guard, we should have expected a, a revolution from Nicky Rod. You know what I mean? <laughs> 2.0, discipline, rash guarded. He's ready. There you go. Chase, favorite match from who's number one last week? That was high on my list as well, but I also really enjoyed Mikey Musumeci, Marcelo Cohen. Yeah. Of course, uh, some questions lingered about what Mikey really wanted to do in that match and how he would react to someone like Marcelo, who was super aggressive and very chippy. And, uh, I mean, it was a dominant performance, as you guys saw. And the finish was spectacular. And like Gordon, in a way, Mikey seemed to have a clear idea of how he wanted to end the match. Oh, yeah. And uh, Quite a similar game plan, actually, like top position mm -hmm. triangle. Mm -hmm. Catch the triangle from top and then finish exactly. it from bottom. But watching someone like that, or athletes like that, impose a specific finish oh, yeah. at the highest level is, is always kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, it really is, really is. Mikey, uh, his Nogi game looked phenomenal, so uh, definitely answered any questions that people had. And there were a lot of questions, like, you know, what's Mikey's Nogi game like? And the answer is very, very, very tight, very solid. I uh, I have a favorite match, I think, but uh, we will take a really deep look at that later because we have a highlight video to uh, to feature a little later. But I think that my favorite match in terms of uh, aggression, in terms of activity, uh, in terms of just pure entertainment, was definitely Rafael Aguedes against Maggie Grindaddy. That was a yeah, yeah, that was, was a really good one. It was an awesome card, and yeah, I'm looking forward to looking at that footage a little bit later here. Yeah, definitely. So moving on from who's number one to some up-and-coming news 
Uh, the news that William Tackett got promoted to black belt over the weekend. Yeah, great news. Super well deserved. I mean, he's been fighting at the black belt circuit in Anogi uh, competitions forever, it seems like. So yeah. m- more of a formality at this point, but great to see it done. And also looking forward to seeing William um, compete in the black belt gi division. Let's go ahead and uh, also we have a quick video of him getting his pr- promotion here. Oh, nice. Always a special moment to see somebody get promoted to black belt. But uh I mean, to be honest, at this point, it's kind of a formality, right? Because, you know, William has been competing at the highest level since he's pretty much like a blue-purple belt. I mean, we saw him compete at ADCC trials as a blue and a purple belt and and, and literally medal, you know, hit the podium there. He was an ADCC alternate while still a purple belt. And, um, you know, he got his brown belt at the very beginning of 2020, uh, served the requisite one-year period as a brown belt, is now promoted a black belt. But doesn't really affect his nogi that much you know because he's been like i say going head to head with some of the biggest names in the world in you know that whole time right Corey? yeah and and i'm I'm curious here i haven't i can't recall anybody who's avoided him because he's a brown belt and you know as as a as a higher level black belt you don't always want to take on the match against a brown belt because there's it's really a lose-lose uh william tack is kind of always surpassed that he's been able to to compete against just about whoever but i'm curious if he'll get any new matches uh given his new rank yeah i I don't see anybody avoiding william you know in fact quite the opposite i think people will be looking for matches with william because he's the number uh three ranked Mm -hmm. you know uh, 185 pound grappler in the world and you know with good reason so it makes sense that all those other guys in the rankings they don't look at him as oh well he's just a brown belt no quite the opposite no he's one of the top guys in the world but um, now there's absolutely no shame in losing to a black belt because, you know, you are a black belt world champion or an ADCC mm-hmm. veteran and some upstart brown belt comes along and takes you out. That, that could sting. So. Stings a bit more. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> of course, that was with Professor Rodrigo Cabral there, Brukutu, here in Austin, Texas, Brazilian yeah. Fight Factory. Uh, man producing some monsters out of, of course Andrew Tackett was on who's number one and yeah, had a Andrew very dominant younger. win too yeah those Tackett's man. are scary scary animals yes they are indeed so uh speaking of Austin Texas we had a lot of jiu-jitsu here in town over the weekend huh uh because of course who's number one on Friday night and then William getting promoted to black belt Saturday afternoon and then Saturday night fight to win 168 yeah we were definitely busy this weekend it was a lot of fun uh, i really enjoy my fight to wins in town we can go to every show and this was a stacked women's card you know 20 or 30 plus i think matches um and the main event was badass you know nat jelly versus kendall Rusing. this is kendall's first time back in the gi in a little while and uh they really threw down we have a, a quick highlight here nat jelly just looked phenomenal um right here we're seeing her pass right into like a clock choke basically and then this transition you'll see is pretty nuts um, oh yeah i think once she got on top her her movement on top was incredible it was so fast she was able to to pass the guard and you know it's uh it didn't take her long to to find the back right there was that moment i don't think you included it where they kind of roll off the oh, stage it's happening right here oh right okay so they f- almost fall off the stage right here and they they get reset not actually deep in the choke they get reset with like with you know sort of with the grips but uh, yeah, once Nachi was on the back, she wasn't letting it go, right? No, no, she's in a great spot. And, you know, multiple time world champ, tough to lose that position um, for her. But yeah, phenomenal performance. And I, I was actually nervous when, when Kendall fell off the stage like that because she's coming off of a pretty bad back or spine injury. Oh, yeah? And so, yeah. I mean, she was hanging there off the edge of the mat. Didn't look great, but she seemed to be fine. You know, she's posted on Instagram that yeah. everything's okay. But I'd like to see that match run back again, uh, but this time Nogi. You know? Yes, yes. Because obviously so. Kendall, you know, she's really well known as having a wrestling background. She's, you know, a, a very high pedigree Nogi grappler as well. But now she's a Nogi world champion and currently the number one pound for pound ranked Nogi female grappler in the world after her win over Gabby Garcia. So I think a match between Nachi and Kendall, Nogi could be a lot of fun. But that wasn't the only match on the on the card as well because Luisa Montero uh, scored a, a really nice knee bar submission. And if you play this clip right here, a little highlight because Nachi, uh, excuse me, Luisa, uh, I mean, she's, she's looked on fire lately. She's been scoring submissions left right and center and uh, but this one the knee bar is something that we haven't seen from her for quite a long time because I remember way back 2016 early 2016 she competed at the IBJJF European Championships and she was just on a the warpath in that event and she was knee barring and leg locking everybody she was hitting toe hold she was hitting knee bars she got a really well developed leg lock game but she herself kind of told you know she we spoke after this event and she was saying yeah i kind of 
kind of stopped doing them, you know, because everybody in the gym knows my game, so I kind of stopped going after the legs. Well, you can see here now in this clip, this whole sequence, she uses the spider guard so well. She's got a great open guard. And then look at the way that she uses the open guard to basically go underneath, catch the leg, and then go straight onto the straight knee bar. And there, there's the tap. I mean, it was on as she was hitting the ground. There was no, no adjusting necessary. Very, very tight finish. It's a really nice piece of jujitsu. Oh yeah, beautiful sequence, and she is an absolute monster with with those uh, lower leg attacks. Very nice lower you, limb attacks. Yeah, lower limb attack. You, you're a fan of leg locks, Corey. What did you think of that sequence? That setup was very similar to the one that she uh, she set up Jessica Flowers with just a month ago. Um, so very similar setup. The the previous one went to a toehold, I think, but the the same outcome really. Is she's two submissions uh, on the fight to win stage in two months. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, absolutely very, very impressive. Um, kind of interested to see what's next for Louisa. You know, I spoke to her after the event and, and she was saying that she would love a, a rematch with Liz Clay in the Gi because, you know, they fought no Gi and Liz won by submission, mm -hmm. by heel hook. But she, uh, you know, Louisa is definitely interested in competing more. But she says, you know, that with her, uh, her sort of her injuries and stuff, you know, it's hard to train hardcore no Gi. So she's definitely looking to pick up as many Gi matches as possible. But, you know, Liz is now the title holder, I believe, uh, heavyweight, I think, in um, or middleweight, I should say. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly which which belt it is, but she has a title belt to fight to win and Louise would like a shot at it. So I like that fun. match. Let's, I hope to see what happen. Yeah. Uh, speaking of fun matches, uh, I mentioned it very briefly earlier. The performance of the week, Rafael Aguedes versus Maggie Grindaddy. So I'll just play this, uh, this highlight video because it's a nice extended highlight of some of the best moments from this match. Rafael Aguedes, the Atos black belt, a rookie black belt, no less. Only six months into her black belt career, and yet already just dominating and taking out the opposition. She's a double pan uh, champion, uh, sorry, double gold pan champion, double gold nogi pan champion. And now here, she's a veteran of fight to win. She's a veteran of subversive. And uh, who's number one, putting on another very dynamic uh, performance. Some great wrestling, some great takedowns, great top game, great finishing. Just all around, really, really solid athlete yeah half hour get is, is terrifying in, in the best way i mean she's super elite as you mentioned in basically all areas of the game i really uh enjoyed her her wrestling and the use of the clinch kind of like a tie a tie clinch where you saw andre galvao do the same thing quite a bit uh flute penna and, and many other times but it just weighs on the opponent forces their head down they take a shot or they get guillotine or you, they open up for a, a double leg or something like that so Rafael looked look phenomenal and i also as we're seeing here had a she had a really active closed guard yeah, game right top and bottom which is sometimes can be hard to get going in no gi Corey, what, what, what are you thinking throughout this match yeah Rafael is such a forward fighter right uh, she, she she just doesn't stop with with her pressure and her forward motion and even i think maggie wrestled out of one of these uh one of these uh, back attacks Rafael was in Rafael came right back forward, scored another takedown, and just it's constant pressure. Um, and it's not just pace, right? It's it's the, for lack of a better word, aggression that she she comes out with, or like the assertiveness. Yes, yeah, absolutely. She's super confident, supremely confident. And for someone that just got their black belt less than a year ago, I mean, the sky's really the limit. And here's another big takedown attempt. But yeah, I, I gotta say, Maggie's resilience in getting out of this choke right here blew me away. I did not expect her to uh, to survive this one, but she managed to uh, to find a way out and to shake off Rafaela. Uh, just goes to show. I mean, Rafaela using Wagner Hosha style face smothers, mm -hmm. and but was able to find the choke the second time. Just I think wore wore down Green Daddy's defenses to the point where it was just you know there was no escape. But a really impressive performance, very dynamic, and I gotta say. Right now, I'm not so sure how many people there are out there who could beat Rafaela Geddes. I mean, she's already had a match with Liz Clay on Subversive not that long ago, and Rafaela won that one. And, you know, Liz Clay is one of the best no-gi talents uh, in the female division. So it's a, it's a big question about who's next for Rafaela. We do have some options, and we're definitely looking to, to set some matches up in the future. But... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, look out, man. This could be the Rafael Aguedes era. You know, I'd love to see her fight more, so that uh, wouldn't dis disappoint me. Also, we should give some credit to, to Maggie Rindotti for going out the next day or two days later oh, yeah. at yeah. Orlando Open, taking home gold uh, and the MJGF uh, Open there. No better Fantastic. way to get back on the you know, horse, Way to right? cap, cap off the weekend after a tough loss, come back and win something big like that. That's awesome, you know. Yeah. Real, real fight right there. 
So, uh, as you mentioned there, that was the IBJJF Orlando Open that went down over the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, in Florida. And uh, we actually have some uh, some highlights for this. But, uh, Corey, you were you kept a pretty close eye on the results from the Orlando Open. And um, you've got some insight as to what went down there. So, what can you tell us? Yeah, I think the, the biggest story here is that AOJ is at it again, right? Uh, Jonathan Alves won the lightweight division. Tynan Dalpra won the middleweight division. Um, in the Gi, uh, uh, Canuto ended up taking the absolute title after losing, I think, in the uh, semifinals in uh, God, either middleweight. The, uh, middleweight division, right? Yeah, he's gone up to middleweight because, of course, we've always seen Hinato at lightweight, right? So going up to middleweight but then stumbling. And uh, what do you think? How, how did he look in those earlier rounds? Do you think he just needed that time to kind of dust off the cobwebs and to kind of uh, warm up a little bit and then he was looking good for the absolute? I think what? that's exactly it. He, mm -hmm. uh, we saw shades of, of uh, regular Canuto in, in the middleweight division, but he definitely came out with the, the pace and the explosiveness and the creativity we expect from him uh, when the absolute rolled around. Got it. So tell us what we're looking at here. This is some clips from the uh, from the IBJJ. This Orlando is Michael Open. Liera. He finished a triangle. I believe this was the quarterfinal. Um, or uh, yeah, I, th I think this is the quarterfinal. Um, we've got another another gi clip coming up of Tyne Dalpera and his his pass. Can he get a submission? Also a no gi event on Sunday. That's Pedro Mourinho there with his trademark guillotine. Right. This was uh, his his IBJJF black black belt debut. This was in the final. He finished Giancarlo Baroni, but he also. Uh, uh, hit a hit an earlier guillotine uh, in the the semifinal. No surprise. <laughs> right. uh, this is Canuto, I believe, um, in the weight class, um, finishing a, a a collar choke here. Now we haven't seen much of uh, Hanato for a while. You know, he didn't compete that much in in 2020. And uh, this is Juni Ocasio on bottom. Juni took gold. He took gold in the light featherweight division. Yes, uh, this was uh, the semifinal, I believe. He finished this heel hook in 28 seconds. Oof. Oh wow, that is fast. Yeah, Juni put into uh, to good use the the new IBJJF no gi rules, right? Being able to heel hook. I like that. Once again, we've talked about this, but dropping back from top position. That's right. Yeah, and, and I think it's a great strategy, right? He came up, he scored his two, and then after you're on the board, a, a nice opportunity to sit to sit back. Nice. Uh, other heel hooks on the day. Tex Johnson won the absolute uh, against I think John Carlo, John Carlo Bodoni by heel hook. He also scored a knee bar on the day. Well, this is this is Tynan Dalpro here with what looks like it's going to be a, a pretty solid armbar finish, right? Right. And the the whole the the whole match leading up to this, uh, a whole lot of what you'd expect from Tynan, right? Solid, smooth yeah, passing. That was crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's going to be a. I mean, already he's a force, but I mean, who who's going to stop Tynan? Tynan's really made an impression on the division already. So far, yeah, I think, I, I, I may be wrong, but so far I think Tynan may even be undefeated as a black belt, right? I don't think he's lost. I believe you're correct. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't, obviously hasn't competed a, 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 a huge deal as yet, but he's uh, he's working his way through the through the competitions that are available to him and, and picking up momentum every step of the way. So I'm definitely interested to see what happens when Tyner meets an elite level black belt uh, opponent you know he's mm -hmm. he's definitely been doing very very well you know he's um he's taken out some big names but exactly uh what will happen when the the, the big tournaments like pans or let's hope even worlds comes back and let's see what happens when you've got all those big you know the multi-year veterans of the game come in and the the multiple time world champions and stuff because that's the real test isn't it Oh, yeah. I, I mean, but he's doing the right thing, right? I mean, not that Tynan needs experience, but momentum's <laughs> important, right? As, it is. As you mentioned, and just picking up wins every month, every couple of weeks, that just creates an indomitable mind where you feel nothing can stop you. So, Before we uh, move on to the upcoming events here on Flow Grappling, just a couple of reader questions. And uh, there's a question here. Who are the other guys in the top 10 that Gordon, the top 10 pound for pound ranking that Gordon has not faced? The answer is Wagner, excuse me, Kennedy Maciel and Gio Martinez. Of We're going to need both of them together to yeah. take on Gordon. <laughs> L literally, like, I think so. Yeah, Kennedy, of course, competes at around about 155, 145, depending if it's ADCC, but he's ranked at 155 and Gio is ranked at 145. So I don't think we'll see... Gordon versus either of those guys anytime soon. But if you look at the rest of the uh, the rest of the ranking, he has submitted Cyborg, Kain and Duarte. He's actually submitted his teammate Gary Tonon. He submitted Matthias Denise. He submitted his now teammate Craig Jones. Submitted him in the past. Recently submitted Wagner Hocher, and obviously not too long ago submitted Roberto Jimenez as well. It's impressive so, list. 
It's a very impressive list. And, um, you know, this is the current pound for pound ranking. It has not yet been updated following last weekend's Who's Number One. We will have some rankings updates coming through in the near future. So speaking of the near future, upcoming events on Flow Grappling. I think the big one that we revealed on Friday night was, of course, that Who's Number One is coming back on April 30th, and it is Craig Jones versus Ty Rotolo. That's a fun match. It's a great match. And I, I love how fired up Ty is. You know, um, we, you haven't seen the interview yet, but we, we did spend quite a bit of time with Ty and Craig getting all, all of the uh, footage together for these cool promos we've been cutting. But one thing Ty said was, people are going to count me out on this. You know, Craig's a dominant nogi guy. I'm kind of up and coming, but I'm here to win. I'm here to impose myself. And I like that attitude. It was fun. Spicy. Oh, absolutely. And it's kind of crazy when you think about the fact that Ty is ranked number three in the 170 pound division whereas craig is ranked at number four in the 205 pound division mm -hmm. now obviously ty has been growing just so fast over the last couple of years i have no idea exactly what he weighs now but i'm pretty sure he's well north of 170 he's probably 180 185 thereabouts but you know he's a lot bigger than you may think you know he's just you know he's still young he's just growing so fast and um of course you know craig is a is a legit 205 pounder you know he's right up there in the high 190s around the 200 mark but uh he knows that he's got a target on his back he knows that ty's going to come out and try and take his head off all the better i mean i yeah. mean it's gonna it's gonna be a fun match you know if you've watched a single rotola match between ty or his brother kate you know that they're non-stop action super aggressive and i think Craig matches up well for that because if he has a cagey opponent who likes to play on the outside on the perimeter, well, we've seen what happens in those matches. It's not always the most exciting. Corey, what do you make of this matchup? Yeah, I, I'm I'm really like I'm impressed by Ty's confidence going into this for sure. How many people can you can you think of that are confident in a in a, a matchup against Craig Jones? Um, but I, I'm really excited to see what his movement style, and especially that, that leg pinning passing we've been seeing oh, them yeah. do, how that might neutralize some of the early threats from Craig Jones' leg locks. If, if Craig bails from the leg lock strategy, what else are we going to see from him? There, there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting things at play in this matchup for sure. That is a great question. Um, Ty's lock, leg lock defense looked phenomenal against Nicky Ryan, you know, and obviously Nicky's a, uh, a, a, an all-rounder, but you know, just like anybody else who trains under John Dana has a, a master a mastery of the, the lower body attacks. But um, yeah, Ty versus Craig is a different animal, and I, I got to say that you know, looking at looking at it strategically, you have to think that you know, Ty is not going to go into a leg lock attack against Craig. He's going to be head hunting, right? He's going to be going for either for that DAS or he's going to be looking to get the back and work on a choke there but uh you know he'd have to work hard because craig's guard is pretty phenomenal expecting especially if he can lock you down into like that z guard right i mean i think that's the question at hand right like mm -hmm. how, how does ty uh play a distance game and where does he enter you know yeah. but it's definitely gonna be looking for a scramble he's called his game something to the effect of controlled chaos you know where yeah people may think it's a scramble but really Ty is forcing a reaction, right? And that's that's what he's looking for. So, but, I mean, if you want a, a, an example of how uh, Craig is able to handle explosive, dynamic opponents, just go back and look what he did with Ronaldo Jr. It's true, you know. So Ronaldo, of course, is is very much like Ty in that respect. Uh, maybe not quite as unpredictable, but still very dangerous and very fast and very explosive, and has a very similar kind of passing style. And Craig was able to find that submission. You know, didn't take him that long, really. We'll be rolling out the rest of these matches coming to Who's Number One April 30th this week. Every and day this week. There are some solid bangers on the card. It's going to be, <laughs> going to be fun. Some bangers indeed. Uh, speaking of bangers, unfortunately, there is some, uh, some big news came through that, uh, unfortunately, Jamil Hill and Thiago Macedo are both out of uh, EUG promotions this weekend, April 3rd. But... No problem, because replacing Jamil is Kennedy Maciel, and replacing Thiago Macedo is Johnny Tammer. So the eight-man lightweight gi tournament still looks pretty solid. Right. For those of you that don't quite know what we're talking about, goes down this Saturday. It's Evolve Your Game, EUG. It's an eight-man, 160-pound tournament, and it's stacked. We just heard, of course, those replacements coming in there with Johnny Tama and, uh, and Kennedy coming into play. But we also have Jonathan Alves 
Andy Murasaki, I think Dota Lions in the mix. Marcio Andre will be there. Johnny Grippo and Mateus Gabriel is also on hand. That's a sick lineup. It's a great lineup, and I've said it before, so again, just really, really looking forward to seeing some high-level gi action back. Uh, man, it's going to be a really good one. Very, very difficult to pick a winner in that tournament. And also a little word about the bracket. So we'll, there will be a bracket reveal on Friday night after the athletes have weighed in. And it's going to be pick your poison because they are going to draw their opponents out. There's going to be a random lottery named out of a hat as to how the bracket is made. So there is no seeding. It's going to be completely random. And that that is wild because we have absolutely no idea what to expect with the first round matches. Oh, yeah, and that will definitely shape the way this thing uh, plays out. Who has the toughest road? Will that be on Instagram or something? Or how will people see the uh, the drawing? Are we just going to find out about it later? I mean, we're going to tell everybody on Friday night. So, yeah, go. go to Flow Grappling and find out. Don't worry. It'll be there. We'll be there. I'm going to be there in Vegas this weekend. So, can't wait. Uh, speaking of big events, wow. Big news that the Abu Dhabi World Pro returns on April 8th and 9th in, of course, Abu Dhabi. Now, this is the postponed 2020 World Championships. Uh, of course, the unfortunately, the, the shutdown last year uh, occurred in around about March, and that meant that the April World Pro from 2020 was not cancelled, but postponed. They tried postponing the date a number of times, but of course, that you know, kept getting extended, extended, extended. So roughly one year, then it should have taken place. The delayed 2020 World Pro will take place. And they may even try to slide in a 2021 World Pro tournament before the end of the year. But uh, we've been told that there are a number of big name black belts competing uh, this this time around. And we've seen a number of them have already started kind of arriving uh, in Abu Dhabi for the tournament. Uh, we're just looking, you know, you've got guys like in the, the featherweight division. You've got people like Mayor Malvez, uh, Lucas Pinheiro, uh, Paulo Miao is signed up. And then going up through the weight classes, uh, you've got a lot of the big name uh, alliance uh, competitors, but you also have names like uh, you know Gabriel uh, Souza, you know Thiago Macedo is signed up. Um, man, these divisions are actually pretty big. Now I'm scrolling through some of them; it's, uh, it's hard to pick up. But you got Leo Sagiorio, uh, world silver medalist, Marcio Andre is signed up, and then moving up through the weight classes. Uh, now, a lot of locals that you expect, but also the return of some names like Levi Jones Leary, mm. Espen Matisson, Tommy Langacker. You know, these are guys that we haven't seen in action literally since the European Championships in, in, in 2020. It's been absolutely forever since we've seen these guys, but they're going to be alongside Claudio Calasanz, Hudson Mateus, Jamie Canuto, Manuel Hibamar, you know, Isaac Bayens, Gutenberg Pereira. This just name after name after name. So some of the, uh, the top Brazilian talent who have been unable to make it over into the United States because of the travel restrictions were, of course, things with the coronavirus and the, the level of control that they have over there and the safety precautions that they've been taking in Abu Dhabi means that things are uh, much more open and you know the athletes going to be flying in they go through a short two-day quarantine they get tested and then they're good to go so it's pretty awesome to see that we have a high level gi tournament coming up right here on Flow Grappling very very soon yes and to be clear you can watch it here on our platform indeed yeah probably going to be pretty difficult depending on where you are the world because of the time difference but don't worry we have all the replays then just uh, one final word on um, Emerald City Invitational on April 10th. It is a 16-man no-gi tournament. Corey, what can you tell us about this one? Yeah, so I I'm really excited for, for this. It's going to be under the, the EBI format. Um, and uh, a lot of really high-level guys that we haven't seen in a little bit. Uh, I'm talking about guys like it, well, John Combs, uh, PJ Barge is coming back. He's definitely... I'd say one of the favorites because of his familiarity with the EBI system. Um, guys like Oliver Taza, who's replacing uh, Ethan Krellenston. Um, Kim Tara is back. Uh, Jay-Z Cavalcante, who just won his division at uh, Orlando Nogi Open this weekend. Um, you know, Aaron Harris. There's a bunch of super fights on there. Um, John Callistein will be returning. We haven't seen him in... Uh, in a while, as far as I can remember, um, he'll be fighting Siraj Bajram in a super fight. Who are your favorites in that 16 man so far? Who are the who are the the front runners in that lineup? Um, yeah, I, I'd say PJ Barch has to be up there. Um, John Combs too, um, 
Aaron Harris could be a dark horse in this, and I, I really like uh, Taza's chances. Andrew Tack had also slipped into this uh, to this bracket, and I mean we saw him up against a couple of brown belts uh, last couple of last couple of months. But oh, I, yeah. I'd love to see what he can do against some of these higher level black belts. It's interesting because Andrew's told me that he's uh, competed against and beaten, in his own words, two or three black belts. Can't remember. He says <laughs> he know, doesn't keep maybe track. A few. Too but, casual. Uh, yeah, very casual. But has recently now beaten three. Very, very solid brown belts in Nogi matches over the last couple of uh, weeks as well. And um, and yeah, I mean, anybody who watched his performance at Who's Number One on the weekend knows that this guy has just endless cardio. Mm -hmm. Endless mm -hmm. cardio. He went 15 minutes full blast, just start to finish. It was incredible. I, I got tired watching it. Oh, yeah. He's got that youthful energy, right? Just 17 years old. I think it's a smart move for him to jump into the Emerald City Invitational because uh, not only will he test himself against elite level uh, athletes, but... You know, the EBI format is very unique and it takes uh, a certain amount of experience to understand how the overtime works and to develop those specific skills because there are actual strategies and the ways that you, you know, defend yourself in those overtime positions oh, yeah. beyond just doing jujitsu, right? How to make the clock run. All You've got to know how to play the game. Right? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, um, and that is a huge factor. So sometimes these guys who you might think, oh, he's a much superior grappler. Well, I mean, it depends what rule, fat, what rule format are you talking about. Are you talking about points? Are you talking about pure submission only? Or are you talking about, like you said, with the EBI overtime? It's definitely a factor. And, and this event will be using official EBI overtime rules with the blessing of Eddie Bravo. So Emerald City Invitational in Philly on April 10th. And Corey, you're going to that one, right? Yes, sir. I'll be there. Nice. Well, I think that about wraps it up for today's episode. Been fun it has been fun i gotta say man this last weekend was pretty cool who's number one gordon ryan versus wagner hosha definitely a, a very a very memorable event for many reasons but to give you guys a heads up we are going to be just carrying on with the who's number one series of events april 30th is our next event craig jones versus tyro otolo and stay tuned because like we said we have more match announcements coming through this week and then potentially more announcements over events over the coming months. Okay. Stay tuned to Flow Grappling because if you want to know about it, you'll find it right here. There you go. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you soon.